Good morning. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us to worship our Heavenly Father today. We're going to sing praises to God. We're going to petition Him in prayer. We're going to commune with one another as we eat the supper. And we're going to hear a message from God's Word this morning. The scriptures speak to the brevity of life and the need for us to be seeking God and to be in a proper relationship with Him so that we are prepared. Vanity or being vain is not a term that we use that often in our daily language, but we certainly understand the meaning. Ecclesiastes speaks to the vanity of life, to inflated pride or placing value or on empty or valueless things. We're all guilty of that from time to time, putting our priorities in the wrong things. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does a man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes. It's very important for us to recognize the brevity and frailty of our lives so that we won't squander the time that we have here. The psalmist tells us to teach us to number our days so that we may gain a heart of wisdom. God wants us to live with a godly purpose and to be aware of the consequences of our choices. Even Jesus tells us of this urgency when he said, as long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. Jesus wrote to first century Christians, reminding them of the uncertainty of our days. James said, come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. You do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Comparing our lives to a mist or a vapor illustrates how fleeting our days are on this earth. The challenges and promises, problems that we go about in our daily lives often feel endless at times just unsurmountable. But the Bible reminds us that compared to eternity, our individual lives on this earth are like a vapor or a fog that is chased away by the morning sun. As we worship this morning and go about our daily lives, let's be aware of this. Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body, that by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. As I conclude our, our remarks this morning, let's recall the closing statements in Ecclesiastes. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is man's all. As we enter into our worship this morning, and worship our Heavenly Father, let's go to him in prayer and ask for his blessings on our assembly this morning. Heavenly Father, you are worthy of all honor and glory and praise. For you created all things and by your will, all things exist. How marvelous are your works. 
In your wisdom and power, you have made them all to glorify you. Lord, when we behold the vastness of the heavens and consider the works of your fingers, we must ask, who are we that you are mindful of us, poor and sinful men? But Lord, we are amazed at your love, and we are in awe that you are, we can boldly approach your gracious throne with our cares and our concerns as your children who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Lord, we count it a blessing that we can assemble this morning to offer our prayers and to worship you. As we assemble, it's our prayer that you will be pleased and glorified by our worship and praise to you. And Lord, we ask that through our worship, we will be strengthened in our faith and determination to serve you and only you. Lord, we are so thankful that you have revealed yourselves and your truths through, your, through Moses and through the prophets and through our King, the, Jesus the Christ. Lord, we pray that as we study and read your word, and your spirit will guide us to the truths that you intended when you revealed it. We pray that we might cherish and honor your word and that it will be a light to us in this very dark and confused world. Father, we pray that we might learn to appreciate and love you and your mercy and the grace that you extended to us through Christ more and more each day. We are so thankful for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We are thankful for the encouragement we offer each other and for the bond we have with one another through Jesus. It's our prayer that our love and our faith and our service in your kingdom might be pleasing and that we would hold fast to the truth. Lord, as we continue in our service, may, we, may you be glorified. It's in Christ's holy name that we offer this petition. Amen. As we begin our worship and song this morning, I invite you to stand with me as we sing, Come Thou Almighty King. Mm -hmm. Come Thou Almighty King. Be 
for the Jesse Pope will be saying a few words to us this morning to help us prepare to take the Lord's Supper. Before he does that, let's sing, We Saw Thee Not.
did not receive one of the Lord's Supper packets, if you could raise your hand and somebody will, will bring one around to you. If you'd like to follow along, I'll be reading from Romans chapter 4. The book of Romans has been referred to by some as the gospel according to Paul. Of course, the epistle doesn't go through the life of Jesus as the other, as the gospels do, but what it does do is it explains the mechanism of the good news. In the first few chapters, Paul goes into detail on how both Gentile and Jew became lost in sin and therefore could not could no longer stand innocent before God on their own merits. Chapter 3, verse 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All the good that we may do is still tainted by the guiltiness of our sins. So God is merciful and he wants to forgive us. But how does one go about doing that? It's always a challenge to be both fair and forgiving. My father uses this example that he learned the hard way in his first years teaching in college. Early on as an incentive to have students attend all classes, he offered at the beginning of the year that all students with perfect attendance would be exempt from taking the final. As the semester ended, my father had, had some absences himself due to some health issues, and he'd kind of lost control of the record keeping of the attendance. So since he had messed up, he offered to waive the final for all students, but only if they all agreed to it, if it was a unanimous vote. If, if not, then they'd have to take the final. And um, most of the class thought that was great, that they would get that kind of forgiveness, and that was probably because they had absences themselves. But the students that had kept perfect attendance all semester, that forgiveness was not fair. Needless to say, it was not unanimous. And my dad even got a phone call from a, from a parent that was angry because he put his, their son in a, in a difficult position that made the rest of the class mad at him. On a spiritual level, we recognize this. If God provided blanket forgiveness for everyone, heaven would be filled with some of the worst people in history. Hitler, Stalin, John Wayne Gacy, Ted Bundy, mass murderers, rapists, thieves, you name it. In a way, that's tolerance of sin and God does not tolerate sin. It's not fair for those who worked to correct their actions, and it's especially not fair for the people that suffered at the hands of those evil people. So if we are all guilty of sin, then there's no incentive to do right because we're condemned anyway. If we're all forgiven, there's no incentive to do right since everyone's going to heaven. So Paul goes on in Romans to use the example of Abraham to explain the system of faith that God was establishing through the sacrifice of his son. Uh, the system of faith or trust that he will use to justify his people. Chapter 4 begins with, What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? 
For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does scripture say? Abraham believed or trusted in God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Abraham on his own could not claim righteousness. Twice, he lied to kings about the nature of his relationship with his wife, Sarah, in order to save his own hide. The previous chapter had said, there is none righteous, no, not one. But God counted him as righteous because he believed God, because he trusted in God that he would keep his promises. God wants to justify those that trust him. So how can this be accomplished? How can he redeem David? who was an adulterer and plotted the death of Uriah but was still called a man after God's own heart? How can he save Paul who participated in the execution of God's people? How can he do this but still be fair? Starting in verse 13, For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through righteousness of faith or trust. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, and where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring not only to the adherent of the law but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham who is the father of us all as it is written I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of God whom he believed in whom he believed who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist In hope, he believed against all hope that he should become the father of many nations. As he's been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith, and he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words that was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe or trust in him. who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. In order to be both fair and forgiving, to incentivize living a life free of sin going forward, to redeem those that put their trust in God. God paid the penalty for sin himself by sending his son as sacrifice. That way, no one can say that forgiveness is cheap. That way, he can save those who put their trust in him despite our record that has been tainted by sin. Let's pray to, uh, to God to thank him for this bread that represents the body that was not tainted by sin, but yet took the penalty for the sin of the world. You pray with me.
Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the sacrifice of your Son. We thank you for this bread that reminds us that it was broken on our behalf. As this bread is not, not leavened, neither was your son leavened with, with sin as we all are. We pray that we don't take that for granted and, and we know that we do from time to time and we ask that we that you give us patient, that, that you are patient with us so that we can once again walk with you to trust in you that you'll fulfill all your promises that you've made to us. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Let us pray for the fruit of the vine. Father, thank you for not only the perfect life of your son, but for, for his death, the blood that was shed, the blood that should have been ours because we're the ones that are guilty. Thank you for this fruit of the vine. Help it to remind us that it costs dearly to wash away our sins. We thank you for your love and your patience and your forgiveness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
morning is from Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God, the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Jay Clark Anderson just read to us from God's Word. In just a moment, Stephen will be speaking to us from that same passage. We're going to address each other in one more hymn before he does that. Would you stand with me as we sing, Praise Him, Praise Him. Pray. We're continuing our theme uh, of going through uh, the book of Ephesians and a couple other things uh, this year while we look at the idea of being an everyday disciple. Or or the question really is, how does my faith look in my life? What does it mean to be a Christian today? Because what we're dealing with is a very ancient faith. 
It's over 2,000 years old. And if you want to go back further, uh, it's even older than that. We're coming up on the 2,000th anniversary soon of the crucifixion of Jesus. And you can go back even further to the days of Abraham, to the 1800s or perhaps even later uh, in, the, in B.C. And so you're dealing with approximately 4,000 years of human history as recorded in the text of Scripture and in the life of believers since the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. What does my faith look like now, today, in the 21st century in the United States of America in Middle Tennessee or wherever you happen to be living? And so the, the shepherds this year have decided that we were going to focus on that. We're going to take a, an introspective look at our lives and look at the principles that God has given us in Scripture and then we would meet together in smaller groups, in our neighborhood groups, and we would talk about very practical ways in which we can apply these principles to our lives. And this morning we're going to look at an idea, uh, uh, a couple ideas, all, all bound up under this heading of walking wisely. And so Paul will start off in our section here, and he's going to say, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. And then he will say some things throughout the rest of the section here that are going to show us what it means to walk in wisdom. And so Paul himself is now focused uh, and has been for some time on what we're looking at this year. How do you live your life as a disciple of Jesus? What does it mean in your daily life? And, and when we look here at this section, he's not excluding elements of what we might call corporate worship or the idea when the saints come together because that is part of your life. Uh, but when we leave what we would call corporate worship, when we, when we are working in, in the corporate world, and when we're working a, a trade, when we're working at home, whatever we happen to be doing, how do the principles in the text of Scripture come to fruition in my life? What do they look like? What difference do they make? If Christianity is a call to live every day as a sacrifice to God, then there has to be a way to sanctify that sacrifice. There has to be a way to make that sacrifice in a manner that pleases God. Like the priests in the Old Testament had very specific ways in which to approach the altar and bring offerings. We too, then bringing our life, have a way in which we approach the altar, in which we come before the throne of God. And so Paul starts with this idea, walk carefully. It's a circumspect way. You, you, you have to think about what you're doing. The idea of being a believer, the, a disciple of Jesus, is not something that comes naturally. And we see that earlier in the text. When left to our devices, the, where we wind up by our nature are, is children of wrath. It is who we become so that we begin to think and act and live like a child of wrath. Our call out of the darkness, then, is a call to a new way of living. And repeatedly in the text of Scripture, there is this warning of be careful that you don't go back to what you used to be. You cannot go back to the way you used to live. And so here this idea of walking carefully is walking circumspectly, walking with a vision, a determination, an earnestness to avoid stepping back into the darkness. Sometimes... This isn't easy, right? this focus on daily living. Sometimes it's going to be quite difficult. Sometimes it will require changing the people that we, that we spend time with. Sometimes it will require changing the places we go. Sometimes it will require changing habits. Sometimes it will, will, will require changing thought patterns. It, it might require changing a great many things. And if there is anything that I have learned in my life, it's that change is hard. I, I've heard people say, you know, you can't change a leopard's spots or, or various other proverbs that we have that just talk about how difficult it is to change people. And, and honestly, if I am honest with myself, if there, really, if there is no outside motivation, it is so easy, is it not, to just stay the way I am. But there are outside motivators that do call us to be better. And not all of those outside motivations are good. Some people will become better for the sake of earning more money. Some people will become better for the sake of becoming gaining notoriety or fame. Some people will become better because there are people in their life that they love and they want to be better for them. The call of, a discipleship, uh, of discipleship in Christ is to be better because God has redeemed you. God has adopted you into his family. God has paid the price, as we talked already this morning, for sin. 
God has raised his son from the dead so that we too can hope in a resurrection like his. And because God has done all of these things, there is now this calling to walk worthily of the gift that we have been given. You now know who you are as a child of God. You know that you have this changed nature, as it were. So no longer be who you used to be. Strive for something better. Strive for something higher. And this can be hard. If it were easy, there would be no need for these reminders. If it were simple, Paul wouldn't have to repeatedly say the same things in all of the letters that he's writing. If it were something that was easily taken in and imbibed and understood and made part of who we are as individuals, really, would there be much necessary besides the words of Jesus? But what we see is a text of Scripture that has not only the words of Jesus, but people who keep referring back to it, who keep looking back at what Jesus has done, saying, don't forget very much like the prophets with the law of Moses constantly looking back to what God revealed through the prophets saying, remember, don't forget, because it's hard. We have to learn to trust that God's way is the right, the best way to live, regardless of an earthly outcome. We have to desire to do what is right because it is right, not because it is easy or successful or popular. That in my life has been one of the most difficult lessons to learn. Because we often equate right with outcome. And with our faith, it is not always easy to see the outcome. The outcome is glorious. Paul starts with the outcome in chapter 1. He talks about all these things that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit have done, redeeming us, uh, making us their own, marking us as children of God. He talks about this great transformation in chapter 2, about how God has brought everybody together in chapter 3, about the unity in this faith we have in chapter 4. And here in 5, Paul is calling us to live worthily of all these things. And so then we have these ways, this idea that is going to be presented to us in this passage. Not as unwise, we might use the word folly or foolishness, as we'll see often in the wisdom literature in the Old Testament. So don't walk foolishly, but walk wisely. And there's this dichotomy that you will see, especially in the book of Proverbs. It's all throughout the book of Proverbs. And really, if, if you kind of take a step back from the book of Proverbs, there are many speakers in the book, but there are primarily two. There is the woman of wisdom who cries out in the streets, who beckons people to come and hear her voice to avoid destruction and to bring glory to God. She cries out in chapter 1. You can see her. She is the woman in Proverbs 31. And there is this woman of folly who also beckons, who also calls people off into the darkness presented in Proverbs. You can see in Proverbs chapter 4, verses 10 through 19, there's a path of righteousness, and there is also a path of wickedness and violence. And here the call is the same. Not to choose folly, but to choose wisdom. To choose one woman over the other, one path over the other. One leads to life and happiness. One leads to wickedness and death. When we begin thinking about these things, the salvation that God has given us is our motivation for change. This adoption into God's family, this, this seeing the truth, seeing that there is a right and there is a wrong, and being called to choose the right, being called to choose what is true. And it has to affect every level of who we are. It has to affect everything that we do. And so when Paul continues talking about this, the next phrase that he is going to do is that we have to make the best use of the time as it shows up in the English Standard Version. If you have a different one, the King James and the New King James and maybe a few others might use the phrase redeeming the time. Uh, that is a more literal translation, but I think it doesn't necessarily capture the idea as as well in English as make the best use of the time. The Greek word that Paul uses here, it means to buy everything. It's like you put a kid in a candy store and you give them $20 and you say, get whatever you want. Right? They're going to try to buy everything. They, now, if they're like me, they're going to measure out the candy and find out what they can get the most sugar per price per ounce. And, and that's what they will do. But if you give most children money, they're just going to try and buy everything. Everything. So that's the idea. You have been put into this life. You have been given this amount of time. Now buy it all. 
A and the idea seems, it really does truly seem to be what you have rendered in the English Standard Version. Make the best use of the time that you've got. And the reason given is that the days are evil, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. But this idea of redemption, that is the idea, to get everything out of the time that you have been given. There are opportunities now in life to do the will of God. We had been living. We were children of wrath. We were following the course of the prince of the power of air, of the air. But now we are following the, the footsteps of the king of the universe, of Jesus, our Lord. And so now use the time that you've got. Purchase all of it. Make all of it yours. Use it in a way that is going to be walking wisely. So time management then, if we want to think of it in those types of terms, now falls under the purview of our relationship with God. This is ultimately time, is ultimately the most valuable resource that you have. You will never get more of it. You can get more money. People can give you money. You can never get more time. No one can give it to you. What you have is what you've got. You had better use it wisely, is what Paul is calling on us to do here. And so then the question becomes, if we're going to purchase all of this, use that language, if we're going to redeem all of this, and the reason why is because if, if this is connected to the accounting language that Paul uses in the, in the beginning of his letter about how God has lavishly poured out in abundance beyond accounting the grace and mercy and love that he shows to us through his son. If you have been given this great vault, this great storehouse of wealth, then how do you spend it? How do you purchase this time? Really, there isn't a single good answer on this. And I refuse to stand up and tell you all the things in which you may engage and all the things that you may not. That's not my place. I can't find that list in Scripture. But what I do see and what I do find are principles which we can all use to guide ourselves in making this kind of decision. How do I use the time that I have to glorify God? One of the questions that I like to ask myself is what I'm doing making me a better disciple of Jesus in some way? This is often directly related to things like study or meditation or prayer or sharing what you have learned. In the sharing of your knowledge, whether it's evangelism or teaching or some other type of, of teaching or sharing, you will find yourself growing in your discipleship. Another question I will often ask is, is this helping me enjoy the blessings that God has given me. It was not long after my conversion where there were several people that I met. And, and uh, jokingly, when I think of them, I often say, if it's fun, it must be a sin. That's not the picture that is painted for us in Scripture. God made the world a really cool place to live. I can't imagine what it was like in the garden when there was no sin and death and suffering. But I mean, he made things taste good because he wants you to enjoy them. He made things uh, fun to experience because he wants you to enjoy them. He wants you, right? He wants you to stand on a cliff and see a sunset and go, this is amazing. That's what he wants. Otherwise, he would have made them ugly. Right? He wants you to look at tropical fish and go, these things are incredible. In fact, the amazing thing about tropical fish that I didn't know is those brilliant, beautiful, amazing colors that you see serve almost no purpose in the ocean. When you go down to where many of those fish live, they're all gray. Do you know what it takes to make those fish beautiful? Light. The kind of light in the spectrum in which you see the most colors. And so God, when he made the parrotfish, he said, you know what, I'm going to paint this thing so that when it comes up to the light where you can actually see it, or if you take your own light down to them, you can see this amazingly beautiful creature, which otherwise is just varying shades of gray. Now, why would he do that unless he wanted you to think this is an amazingly beautiful fish? Is this helping me enjoy the blessings that God has given me? Am I drawing closer to someone in doing this thing? I refuse to play golf alone. I refuse to do it. If you walk, it takes close to four hours to play a round of 18 holes the way that I play them. I, I realize some people can play golf much more quickly. That is not me. 
In fact, it probably takes about four hours, even if I'm driving the cart. I refuse to do it by myself. Will I play golf with somebody else? Yes, absolutely. So what was considered a waste of my time has now become a valuable use of my time because I am spending it with somebody. I have four hours where they have to talk to me. They are stuck next to me in that cart for four hours, trailing my ball all over the place, and I can talk to them about whatever I want. They may never want to spend time with me again after that, but I've got them for four hours. So all of a sudden, this is a good use of my time. That's why I can't make a list. Is playing a video game a good use of your time? If it's 3 o'clock in the morning and you're by yourself and you're not interacting with another human being, you might want to consider maybe doing something else, like going to sleep. If you are using that time to spend with another person and you are drawing together and you have an opportunity to communicate with them and connect with them, and, and maybe you wouldn't get a chance to do that otherwise, and all of a sudden this becomes maybe a good use of time. Am I learning to be more or less obedient by doing this? Am I trying to skirt around rules, or am I trying to obey the things that God has told me to do? Is this action, whatever it is, is it keeping God's will, God's character, God's desires, is it keeping those things at the center of my life, or is it pushing those things to the periphery? I try not to ask better questions. Is there a better way I could be using my time? Because I really don't know how to measure that. In the sense of, is it better for me to spend four hours playing golf with somebody? Or is it better for me to play video games with somebody if we're doing the exact same thing? I don't know the answer to that question. We don't necessarily have to compare different actions because different things have value for different people in different places, in different times. What matters is asking, is my life centered on Christ while I'm doing this? Am I using this time in a way that is godly? Am I drawing myself closer to others and closer to God? Are these choices, these actions, these things that I'm doing, are they rooted in the wisdom that God has given us? And the reason why that's important is because the days are evil. And now this, this word evil, it can mean morally corrupt, wicked. It can also just mean bad, like not good for you. And so when we start looking at this, I, I don't know that we have to say, well, it means one or the other of those things, because certainly things that are wicked are also not good for you. And so this idea of we live in a time, we live in a place, we live in a culture that, according to biblical definition, is corrupt. Right? There is not a place, that a, a culture that is uncorrupted. There is not a culture that is untainted. There is not a place or a time to which you can go and you say, ah, this is the time when everybody was doing what God wanted them to do. There is no such place. I don't know if you're a fan of 80s movies, but there is a movie called Willow, and the main character in the movie is talking to the evil witch, the evil sorceress in the movie, and he tells her, I'm going to send this baby to a place where evil cannot touch her. And the response from the antagonist is, impossible. There's no such place. Bav Morta was right. There is no such place here. The days are evil. The world walks after the course of the prince of the power of the air. Jesus called Satan the ruler of this world. The days are evil. And so I have to decide how to live in a way in which I can be spreading goodness and love and kindness and grace instead of badness and wickedness and hatefulness and anger and slander and all of the things you see in Galatians 5 that Paul will call works of the flesh. I need to be figuring out how do I produce more fruit of the Spirit how do I do these things? And the answer is that we have to know God's will. That'll be the next thing that he says. You have to do this because the days are evil, so don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And I don't think that in his mind he is limiting this to making sure that you know Scripture. I think he's saying you have to know who God is. Now, a large portion of that is knowing Scripture. 
Because Scripture shows us the character of God. It shows us the nature of God. It shows us the person of Jesus so that we can learn how to think like God, how to behave like God, how to be children of God, so that when I come into a scenario, a situation, a circumstance, which is not specifically dictated in Scripture, where there is no specific prescription for activity, that I will figure out how to work, how to behave, how to be a believer. There are no rules listed in Scripture for Facebook posts, for Twitter feeds. They're not present. But I do see a lot of principles. There are no, there are no discussions of boardroom meetings in, in, in the New Testament. But there are principles, right? And so as I find myself in these various scenarios, I have to know God's will. I have to know God's mind, which the Apostle Paul in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, which would, he'll say that we have this. The Spirit has revealed these things to us so that now I can use them in my daily walk. Do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is in your daily life. There will be things that we come across where, yes, there, God has said, I must do this. God has said, I must not do that. There are also things where there is no direct connection beyond principles. And so my life, whether something is explicitly stated or not, my life always goes back to thus it says, thus it is written. It always comes back to what God has revealed. Can you support people to preach the gospel? Yes, because you don't muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Should you share the things that you have with people who don't have them? Yes, because the one who gathered much had none left over, and the one who gathered little had no lack. Right? These are principles. These are wisdom that Paul sees in the Scripture, and he comes and he applies those specifically to situations for these, these Christians. When Scripture calls specifically for something or it forbids something, we do or we don't do that thing. But sometimes we have to discern. Sometimes we have to determine. Is this using my time well? Is this glorifying God? Is this not? And frankly and honestly, I am not wise enough and smart enough to answer all of those questions by myself. That's why I have you. That's why we have one another. So that we can draw on the wisdom of God's people and we can find out the answers to these questions, and sometimes there will be different answers. Sometimes believers will disagree on what is best. Sometimes believers will disagree on how to apply principles to different situations. And this is why we have things like Romans chapter 14. So the Apostle Paul is going to say this over in Romans chapter 14. Starting in verse 1. As for the one who is weak in the faith, welcome him but not to quarrel over opinions. An opinion here doesn't mean what we often think when we hear opinion. These opinions are well-reasoned out positions. The Supreme Court, they don't render verdicts. The Supreme Court gives opinions. That's the way in which this word is used here. So one person believes he may eat anything while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one eat who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. In other words, you who eats are coming to different conclusions about what you can eat. For God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It's before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day as better than another. They have special days that they have set aside, while another person thinks that all days are alike. There's no special days. Those are distinctly different conclusions. Each one should be fully convinced in their own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor to the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor to the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. While the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and, give thanks, and gives thanks to God. None of us lives to themselves, and none of us dies to themselves. For if we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lives again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. So why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. It is written, right? Here you go. What is the will of God? 
As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each one of us will give an accounting of themselves to God. There may be times where we look at things, and you may say, you can never play golf. That is always four hours wasted. That's fine. Don't play golf. You may say, you should never play video games. That is always a waste of time. Fine. Don't play them. But you have to use that time in a different way that redeems it. One of the things that I did after I got married was I realized that it is not a good idea for me to play video games by myself. It was a bad idea. What they do now, um, for better or worse, is uh, they put timers on games. So you can actually go and look and see how much time you have spent in the game. Thankfully, they spared us from that largely when I was growing up. So I can't look back and see how many days of my life I spent playing games. I was talking to a friend just a couple days ago. And he has one video game that over the past three or four years, he has played for 4,271 hours. I wrote that number down. A work year, a work year from 8 to 5 for 52 weeks is 2,080 hours. He has over two work years of time in this video game. And when he told me that, he was not bragging. He was like, what could I have done with over 4,000 hours of time? You could probably learn six languages. That's about how, how, literally, you could have learned six languages, which would enable you to go preach the gospel in at least, at least six different countries. And if you chose your languages selectively, you could preach in almost any country. Right? So all of a sudden, when we start looking at this, there's nothing wrong with playing a video game. But 4,200 hours might be excessive. And so then we start looking at this, and, and I cannot pass judgment on the way that you will choose to use your time bec because it's different than the way that I choose. But if you ever see me spending 4,200 hours playing golf, please tell me to stop. Or bowling, or fishing, or anything. The exception being if I have somebody strapped into a little cart with me as we're driving around. <laughs> I will take 4,200 hours with that. And so what we're going to see is when it comes to this, there really is no simple thing where we can make a 12-point you know, list, say these 12 things are good, nothing else. It really doesn't work that way. But we do have these principles that guide us and teach us and show us who we ought to be and why. And that gets to this next part where we're going to have to go through it a little bit quickly because we're running out of time. But this idea here, he's continuing on in the same vein of thought about walking wisely rather than foolishly. He's going to say, don't get drunk with wine, for that's debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. This idea of drunk or filled... It seems as though what he's done is he's taking one of the more popular religions in the region, which is the celebration or, or adulation of Bacchus, and he's comparing it to Christ. Right? Bacchus is the god of excessive wine and revelry. And the way that you worshipped him is having those things in your life. And so it seems like what he's saying is, all right, here's how they do things. And here is how you are called to do things. This is the way that foolishness looks, and this is the way that wisdom looks. How have you lived? Are we caught up in the dissipation and revelry of our culture, of Bacchus? There were songs and feasts and great banquets that would be given in his honor in order to celebrate. It's quite the hullabaloo. The louder the party, the more wine, the more honor that was brought to Bacchus. The more wine that was drunk, the greater the glory given to that God. The more kindness that you showed to your neighbors was the more intoxicated you could get them. That was the point of life. 
And before we look back and go, wow, those people were terrible, in the 1800s, the average American consumed 7.3 gallons of pure alcohol a year. 7.3. To give you an estimation of what that means, that's not 7.3 gallons of liquid, that's 7.3 gallons of pure alcohol. To give you an estimation of what that might have looked like, the average American today consumes 2.1. That's 3.3 times the amount, roughly. I think it's like 3.38, right? So take now what you see. If you think, wow, we're in excess now. Multiply that by over three times. That was the 19th century. Now you take that. It's at least that bad, right? In the first century with the Christians that you're dealing with here. That's the kind of thing that is being talked about. Two and beyond excessive. And so Paul is saying, these are the two choices. You have this way, which is full of, full of something, or you have this way that is filled with the Spirit. Choose one. The way that is filled with the Spirit is full of thanksgiving to God. It is full of songs being poured out to the Lord. It is full of a heart that is in tune and harmonizes with God's will. This is the picture that you're being given here. Uh, it is one that gives thanks to God for everything through Jesus. And so this is our idea of this overflowing love towards God, where I'm not, I'm not looking at what I can get or, or anything that I can have necessarily, but what can I do and who can I be to redeem this time that I have been given? And the second part of that, in verse 21, where he finishes up submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, is this overflowing love towards God others. <coughs> He's going to, to draw that out in the end of chapter 5 and the beginning of chapter 6. But here's the question that we have when we look at this section here. How am I walking? Is it in wisdom or is it in foolishness? Am I worshiping Bacchus or am I worshiping Christ? Am I living for myself or am I living for the Lord? There are so many different ways that we can live for Jesus. Ultimately, we will each have to give an accounting for the time that we've had to the Lord. Paul's hope for these believers in Ephesus is that they would walk wisely. He expects that. I know that we together here are dedicated to the same things, that we are dedicated to walking wisely. I can always use help in doing that better. I can always use help in honing what that looks like and becoming a better disciple. And so in our mutual dedication to this, let's encourage and help one another and build one another up so that every day we look more like Jesus. Every day we love more like Christ. And each day we think more like God so that we are getting better and better and better continually. And when people see us, they see a people walking in wisdom drawing closer to God through Jesus, sharing love with the world around us so that each and every person can come to know Jesus. So if you're here this morning, that's the offer. We offer you a family that is dedicated to walking after God. We offer a Savior who has sacrificed himself for your redemption, a spirit who will seal you and claim you as his own, and a father who will adopt you into his family for eternity. You can have those things if you want them. You can be a part of of this family marching toward the Father forever and ever. If you will just come and clothe yourself with Christ while we stand and while we sing our song of invitation.
Well, good morning. In just a few moments, uh, Eric Nash will come forward and dismiss us in a closing prayer. Well, good to see everybody here this morning, and uh, particularly those that are visiting with us. And we're just glad to have you here, and hope you can come back and be with us at any time that uh, you may be in the in the neighborhood and have that opportunity opportunity to do so. Just several announcements. Uh, as most of y'all are aware, uh, we were sad in this past Tuesday morning to to hear of the passing of our brother Mike Hunt. Uh, Mike passed away uh, one day shy of his 71st birthday, and Mike was a member, I think, for Marsha somewhere around 25 years or so. Y'all have been attending here, and uh, we sure will miss, miss Mike. Uh, the, uh, his memorial service was, was held here uh, at the building on Thursday evening. Uh, I have a thank you note from Marsha uh, that I'll put on the bulletin board thanking everyone for all of your, uh, your love shown toward their family during his period of illness, illness and his passing, and I'll uh, so I'll put that on the bulletin board in the back. Uh, let's continue to remember, though, Marsha and, and her family, the entire Hunt family, uh, during the days that are, that are ahead. We, uh, we also uh, have s several of our family members and extended family members that are continue to have uh, various health issues. Uh, uh, look in the bulletin this afternoon and they'll be listed again, but let's continue to likewise to remember them uh, in our prayers. On Wednesday evening after a Bible study, we're, uh, uh, we're excited to, to announce that uh, Jack Sanders was baptized into Christ and uh, we rejoice with Jack and his decision and look forward to uh, serving our Lord alongside him in the days to come. Whitney uh, Loring had put out an email, uh, yeah, I think it was two days ago, maybe yesterday, that but she wanted the congregation to know that uh, through her ongoing adoption process that she has been matched with a birth mother, that uh, and there, the birth mother's to have a, uh, a baby girl at the end of July, so she wanted to ask for the prayers of, uh, of everyone on behalf of the birth mother and the baby, and uh, she wants to thank everyone also for their continued for all of our continued prayers and support for her during this whole process. I've also received a thank you note from uh, Stephen Th Thomas, uh, thanking everyone from the congregation, the family here for the uh, graduation gift. I'll likewise put that on the bulletin board back in the office wing. Uh, there will be a short meeting right after service this morning uh, with uh, Jim Stevenson to kind of, again, go over the, uh, the plans for our Vacation Bible School, which is scheduled for July the 10th through the 13th. Next Sunday, uh, the 29th of May, we'll have a singing here at the building at 2 p.m. Uh, our summer series will start on Wednesday, uh, June the 1st. Marty Broadwell will be here to kick off the series, and it'll be, of course, our focus this year will be a focus on the family during our summer series. There are uh, handouts that are in back in the four years in the back uh, that you can have uh, to send out to folks and to remind everyone there's a QR code on there if somebody some teenagers can come show me how to use it I'd appreciate it okay uh, but uh, anyway one one last announcement before we're dismissed uh, uh, Darrell Reeser reminded me our the Hillsborough Road neighborhood group we were supposed to meet last week we rescheduled for this week this afternoon been a change in venue if you didn't get the email it will be at the Reeves house at Darrell and Margaret's house uh, this afternoon at 4 p.m. for the Hillsborough Road uh, neighborhood group. That's all the announcements I have at this time. Uh, if there's nothing further, Eric. Let's pray. Our dear and gracious Heavenly Father, we bow our heads, recognizing you as the only true and living God, one who's given us life, given us breath, given us time, given us love, grace, and mercy. We are so grateful, Father, that we can be called your adopted children, that we too can have the inheritance of eternal life to live with you for eternity. Father, we are so grateful for the opportunity to worship you this morning, to come to you in prayer, to sing songs of praise, to you for a lesson to be brought to us by Stephen that 
reminds us to walk wisely in the things that we do, using our time in the best possible way to share the love and compassion that you have for each other, that we might encourage one another during that time. Father, we recognize that the only way to do this is to spend time in reading upon your word, learning about what you would have us to do. May we challenge each other each day to spend time with your word and listening and reading, praying and giving thanks for all that you do. Father, we want to recognize too that there, while there are challenges throughout the world, that we have one another. And during difficult times, such as we had this week with the passing of Brother Mike Hunt, we pray that we'll continue to raise up the Hunt family with comfort and love and compassion. That we'll continue to support them as they go through the, these uh, next few days and weeks. Father, we also celebrate in life knowing that there are many great things going on. We're certainly grateful for Jack's decision to be born again, to become a child of yours, Father, that he might live. And we pray that he will live in a way that uh, brings honor and glory to your name as he serves you. And we certainly pray that each of us will continue to support him as he begins his journey towards a heaven with you. Father, we also want to pray for Whitney Loring and the exciting news of her being able to adopt a, a daughter. We certainly pray for the safety of the child and the, the birth mother, knowing that uh, life is given to us from you, and we are grateful for that. Father, as we depart from here, let's remember our leaders who are working so diligently here, our elders who guide us and give us uh, direction and strength and we pray for Stephen and his family as well as the deacons and the work that they do. Father, we ask that you forgive us of our sins. We give great thanks for your Holy Spirit which comforts us and helps us as we come to you in prayer. And it's through your son's name we pray. Amen.